uh, in, the, uh, in September. Uh, and since the conference on birds, I guess I'll be talking about the same. And I thought of his music when I heard that. There seems to be some affinity. But beyond that, I have nothing to say. <laughs> anyone, anyone know this? Anyone? So, no? So, I think this, uh, this piece of music uh, um, met the Turing test. Do you know what the Turing test is? The Turing test is the test uh, of a machine's ability to exhibit uh, intelligent behavior um, in distinguishable form or equivalent to that of a human being. This was written by a computer. Mm -hmm. By a, a computer called Yamus. This is the, the name of the, um, of, of, of the composer, really. And um, um, this one, of course, the composition of music with algorithms and computers is not new today. Of course, we think of uh, Yanis Xenakis in the 1960s as one uh, prominent uh, example. But this kind of uh, composition and this kind, perhaps, of a post-literate uh, musical age that we might be uh, entering now, points me with uh, one of the questions that I wanted to, uh, to ask as a starting point, really, which is how have the forces that that shape the history of music has changed in the decade that elapsed since you published your mm. history of music. Well, I wanted to assure everybody that literacy has not come to an end in <laughs> 10 years. I have to say this because a lot of people, especially reviewers of the book, uh, seem to think that when I said that it is possible to predict the end of the literary tradition, that I meant it was going to end next Tuesday, uh, <laughs> I didn't actually think that. But this is very interesting. You know, this is um, this computer is by no means the worst composer writing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that computer has a better algorithm than a lot of people I've known. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the composers in the room think of that. I uh, won't mention any names, but there are some composers among us. Some who I even knew 50 years ago at Columbia yeah. University. <laughs> It's not very good to a computer. Of course. <laughs> Even the computer's inspiration could uh, flag after four measures. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, what did, uh, first, I just want to mention everyone is welcome to uh, raise their hands uh, when they have something uh, interesting to say. Uh, but, um, how have you done, if at all, things differently? Um, uh, would something like that, for example, enter into your narrative of music? Well, it seems to me that it would fit nicely into my last chapter. Uh, I was always talking about all the different ways in which contemporary technology, and of course, my contemporary, even in the, well, the last um, chapter of that book was written in 2001, actually. It takes a while before things get published. Uh, so in those 15 years, 14, 15 years, uh, you know, uh, things have indeed changed in terms of technology. Uh, when I finished writing the book, it was still the age of the CD, and now it's the age of MP3, and I don't know what to do with all the things that are put in my garage. Uh, so that's one thing, and I see that uh, you know, most deliberate ways of creating music have also advanced. <coughs> Are there post-literate ways to narrate the music history? How do you narrate post-literate? Well, fortunately, uh, when we enter the post-literate age, all the literate texts are not going to disappear. Uh, and I don't know if it will change what I have said about the thing. Although, who knows? Uh, we'll be talk tomorrow about the future of musicology. Not by department, by the way. I, uh, I've retired. Uh, for this term <laughs> from UC Berkeley. So I'm not part of the future of musicology. I'm completely in the past at this point. Uh, but, you know, the future is um, probably going to change the way we see things. We don't expect you to know how now. Uh, maybe some of you know. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow, right. Oh, the, that's, right. that's the future. <laughs> 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 All right, we shouldn't talk about that now, right? <laughs>
Leave the future in the future. <laughs> I want to give uh, one perspective that's, that's coming from the cognitive that realm. There is a nice study by Stefan Kirsch in which he presents uh, listeners with pieces, with rows, Schoenberg rows. For some listeners, he tells them this was written by a computer. For others, he tells them this, is re this was written by a composer. And of course, their brains react differently. Um, when they think it is a composer, there are a lot of networks that are related to relating to people and agents outside the world. Of course, that would, that's not a surprising finding, is it? It, it is not. No, because so our reactions to anything depend on the associations mm -hmm. that we have exactly. with it. Uh, another case in point, a little less radical, but perhaps familiar, there are pieces of music of, whom, of which the authorship is disputed. You know, and I'm thinking particularly of the Symphonia Concertante for four wind instruments and orchestra, attributed to Mozart, but not by everybody. <laughs> uh, and uh, a man I know named John Spitzer, who wrote a dissertation long in advance of this kind of study being uh, fashionable, a dissertation on the concept of authorship. Uh, in Western music. And uh, he surveyed the critical literature on this Sinfonia Concertante uh, and discovered, again, to nobody's surprise, that the people who thought it was by Mozart thought it was a much better piece than the people who thought it wasn't by Mozart. It was the same piece, but you know, having a good brand name always helps. <laughs> Uh, the but uh, I'd like to change the perspective to the issue of literacy. That the Western art music is a literate tradition. And also, uh, it comes with an it's accompanying discourse. Of course, the art of accompanying discourse is already inherent in the, in the, in the notation, which gives you some criteria. And my question is, question of, to your comment on the post-literate era, would, it, would you say that uh, what will happen to this accompanying discussion, this course? What can happen? Right? Well, what can happen? Okay. <laughs> no, no. Your guess is as good as mine, or well, probably better since you've been thinking because about this question. Because there are some, you know, there's the Google kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the statistics, um, which is no discussion. Well, but everything comes with the discourse, of course, and uh, when things, when paradigms change, it isn't as though an old paradigm is utterly replaced by a new paradigm. Uh, the new way of thinking joins the old way of thinking, and there's a very dynamic interaction between the two. The relationship between pre-literate and literate ways of thinking about music have been coexisting ever since there's been musical notation. And I would say that the, uh, my <coughs> history is the history of that interaction. Uh, there were ways of thinking about music that were already in place when notation was first invented. Uh, the invention of notation did not, not have immediate momentous consequences uh, for the way in which people <coughs> thought about music. And even still, there are plenty of ways in which we still conceptualize music and still transmit music from one to another that don't depend or that must be invoked along with notation for there to be performance. If you've ever attended a rehearsal, and I'm sure we've all been in rehearsals, you know, uh, when musicians get together to prepare a piece, they usually sing to each other more than they talk to each other. Uh, and when conductors lead orchestras, they do it with gestures uh, and with grunts and, you know, shouts and persons and but often non-verbal sounds, um, to say nothing of non-literate. Uh, so there is a coexistence of various modes, including the literate. So since we don't have an exclusively literate, literate uh, approach to music now, uh, we won't have an exclusively <coughs> post-literate approach to music later. It seems to me that our way of thinking now will persist and will be modified by whatever comes later. Beyond that, I don't feel comfortable making any predictions. 
Uh, but the prediction I'm making now, not a terribly impressive one, I have to admit, but still, it's based on what can be observed about the way in which we think about music in terms of both the literate and the preliterate. Uh, my question is about the ebb and flow of simplicity versus complexity in the field, in my, in our, in my field of composition. Uh, I belong to the complexity, and of course I lament what I see around me in terms of uh, But obviously there was all through history an ebb and flow and uh, reaction to one another. Is there anything more intelligent to say about those, uh, about the detector of, uh, or, or just as obvious as I stated? I don't know if this is an intelligent thing to say, but... Uh, <laughs> It seems to me that you, you, the way you're con, uh, conceiving of this history is in terms of a pendulum, right? Uh, goes from complexity to simplicity, and it means that whatever happens is in direct reaction to what has happened before. Sure. I'm not sure that's really the way things uh, do occur. I think that there is a uh, coexistence always of these ways of thinking. And don't forget that your uh, career has been spent in an environment that favors complexity. All through that same time, there were music theater uh, composers who were writing simple music. There were folk musicians. Yeah. Uh, there were popular musicians. Uh, with one difference. Yeah. Now, the serious so-called composers, yeah. they do not. Not all of them. The not all of them. Well, and even during the time when you think that complexity was without rival, uh, there were plenty of people who you weren't paying any attention to, who now you've got to pay attention to. And that's what has changed, it seems to me. Not that there are people writing a different kind of music, but that our attention has shifted. Uh, why has that happened? Well, that's really the story that took me 800 pages to tell <laughs> uh, in the last volume of, uh, of the Oscar history. The volume which, of course, has attracted the most controversy because my version of the history of the last um, 70 years uh, since the, I pick up the, the last volume covers the period after World War II uh, differs the most from the, the version that you'll read in previous textbooks because those previous textbooks have followed a, uh, a narrative very much influenced it seems to me by the uh, German romantic narrative of the 19th century, uh, which has always favored the idea of greater and greater uh, differentiation, greater and greater complexity, greater and greater technical, uh, um, the, the uh, advancement of technique. Uh, and so if you narrate the history of music in those terms, it, which implies, of course, evaluation of the thing that you see as the dominant uh, trend, uh, then you will have a story that uh, favors complexity as a, uh, a kind of goal. Uh, greater complexity uh, testifying to greater control of material and a greater intellectual grasp and so on. Uh, I don't think that that is the full story, and I tried to fill in some of the rest of the story. Uh, which made it look to a lot of readers like I was rejecting the complex. Uh, I have a pair of chapters in the book where I um, talk about Benjamin Britten and talk about Elliot Carter side by side uh, as representing these two strands at their most highly developed and at their most respectable. Um, and I picked those two composers because neither one of them actually was an academic composer. It didn't make a living the academy. Uh, so you couldn't say, well, complexity is academic and simplicity is, you know, the real world. Uh, both of them were uh, composing uh, outside of the uh, academy, but one of them was writing the music that was valued by the traditional narrative, and the other was not. Now, I don't know whether it would surprise anybody here. I think younger people here would be surprised when they learned that Benjamin Britten was not particularly respected in the musical academy when we were students. Uh, whereas now he's really thought of as a very major figure in the 20th century. But that's an example of the change that I was talking about. Uh, 
Well, Elliot Carter was thought of. I remember the day Stravinsky died, and we were sitting in the room where I used to sit with you at Columbia, where the junior faculty uh, had their had their desks. And I don't remember who it was I was talking with. Bruce Taub was one. You remember him? Sure. Uh, and, yeah, well, there were several of us were. Gee, Stravinsky said, who's the greatest composer now? <laughs> uh, and somebody said, Elliot Carter? And we all went. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody came up with another name. <laughs> Because uh, he was clearly the kind of composer that we were taught to value. Yeah. But that was uh, perhaps the beginning of the heretical view that I've expressed in the Oxford history. The fact that we didn't really think he was going to fit that bill. And as a matter of fact, we didn't think anybody would fit the place that Stravinsky had, had vacated. Now, why was that? That was the question that I you know, determined a great deal of what I wrote. In, the, in that volume. And why would Elliot Carter not be the natural uh, or acceptable successor to Stravinsky uh, as the greatest composer? I mean, I could tell you the reasons why I think we were shrugging and pulling long faces, but uh, I probably intuitively that you probably are feeling some agreement uh, with what I'm saying, that there was something about Stravinsky that Carter could not completely match, even though he was thought of as tops in the musical <coughs> academy. But Stravinsky was thought of as tops in the musical academy and outside the academy. And there was nobody uh, who could command that kind of uh, feeling that he was supreme, both in and out of the academy the way Stravinsky did. And there's been nobody since, I think, who has been equally valued, <coughs> equally honored inside and out. And the fact that there isn't such a figure, I think, is also historically significant. So that's the way I think I was trying to shape my story, to try to explain why that, our present is exactly the way it is, and not some other way. Except that now, within the academy, you have courses on rap, and you have you right. the, whole, the whole shift, right. in, including other There's stuff. far less hierarchy uh, in the way in which we, within the academy, uh, categorize genres. And within genres, uh, rank composers. It's far less hierarchy. But that, of course, requires explanation. Why were we so hierarchical in the 1960s and so relativistic now? Obviously, the reason for that goes way beyond music. Uh, and so that's, that's the task to try to explain. Uh, not to advocate or to denigrate, but to explain why the situation now is so different. Um, writing uh, music takes a, uh, writing about music takes a lot of courage. Writing about only music takes a lot of courage. What are some of the things? I think the actual word is chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the things you mentioned in between those who found that their their music their interests were under or not represented? Especially, I again, I assume the 20th century. But yeah, well, not only the 20th century. You know the. I wrote this book. Some, I know some of you have seen it. it uh, it's five volumes in this paperback edition. There were six volumes in the original hardcover. And it's uh, about 4,000 pages. And so many of the reviews were just big lists of things I omitted. So I just wanted to ask these people, you wanted it to be longer? <laughs> uh, uh, Everybody looks for their favorite, you know, and if it isn't there, well, the whole book is terrible. Um, so it isn't just in the 20th century where, uh, but you know, actually, uh, since I was setting out not to write the telephone book, but write a, you know, a narrative, that was, for me, the determining uh, question. Does the narrative need me to talk about this? Uh, and if I didn't feel the narrative needed it, even if I liked the music, I didn't mention it. And I did talk about a lot of things that I don't particularly like. And I challenged readers in the preface that some of you read uh, to tell where I liked it, where I didn't like it. And all the reviewers thought it was so obvious. And I'm here to tell you that they were all completely wrong, uh, I'm happy to say. Um, but 
At the same time, I did take some of that criticism to heart. It isn't as though, you know, I feel that uh, my choices were definitive and that anybody's uh, guessing is not even worth consideration. Uh, so many of the reviewers said, well, but you don't say anything at all about Elgar. You don't say anything at all about Vaughan Williams. Guess where those reviewers were? Uh, <laughs> yes. um, and I thought after a while, you know, I do so kind of pay uh, very little attention to English music. Is there any way I can incorporate it that would truly serve the narrative? Uh, and I thought, yes, there is a good way, I thought. Uh, and I also thought we're very lucky it's a very lucky thing that the place where I thought I might be able to accommodate some of these English composers was the last chapter of one of the volumes, which meant that when they issued the paperback, they were able to add 30 pages to the last chapter of volume three, which meant they didn't have to reset the whole book. Uh, they could keep the pagination up till they had the same, everything you know, to change the index. So I was able to get them to read to do it, so if you have uh, the hardcover version of volume three traded into the paperback, it has 30 extra pages, you'll find Elgar, you'll find Ola Williams, you'll find Sibelius, who I actually regretted not having included. I think he's a very, very significant figure. Uh, but when I was actually writing the book, you know, with Siri Atom, I didn't think of the place for him where the narrative really needed him. And then I found that he also added something to the end of that chapter. Uh, and one of the things that adding at the end of that chapter did, the third volume of the 19th century. Um, and when I added the part that uh, was answering these critics, uh, I found it made sense to continue the narrative up until the middle of the 20th century so that I could take into account the later works of Lord Williams, who lived a long life, you know, uh, and that would make it possible for me to re-emphasize something that I try to emphasize periodically all through the book, uh, which is that I was not telling one continuous story, one continuous evolution in which, uh, you know, A was replaced by B, replaced by C, uh, in a constant single stream, but there was a huge amount of overlap. Uh, that his histories of genres are not necessarily synchronous with histories of styles. Uh, to, pick, to pick one place where you can easily see the difference. Uh, and so if you're going to uh, do a, an adequate job of historicizing styles and also historicizing genres, you're going to have to run forward and then go back and come forward again. Uh, and this was a nice way of re-emphasizing that. So since I found that you know, I was able to accommodate some of the critique and also benefit the narrative, that I looked for places where I could do that. Um, but sure, there are lots of things that I've left out. Uh, you know, uh, I Speaking of the narrative, uh, it brings another issue, uh, which we touched upon already in this discussion. And this is, of course, in relation to the computer composer, the question of agents and agency, about which you write quite vehemently uh, in the introduction, and, and, then, and then later on in the 2014 uh, paper that was published in the Journal of Musicology. And it brings, indeed, uh, us to the very epistemology of the writing of history and any history, the history of music in particular, and just, oh, sorry, this is mine. What I want to say is that, um, so you have agent, agents, agencies, close together for you with the concept and category of people rather than individual. The individual, for some reason, you and negate as an ontological uh, category with which to work. And now the question is how one uh, writes a history. And whether between uh, your really very fascinating and thought-provoking introduction and the text itself, to what extent could you really keep to what you, uh, uh, I'm sure that you wrote it afterwards, uh, the introduction. I mean, in terms of the 
the issues of determinism on the one hand, the death of the author that you also refer to on the other. And I'd like to somehow to make a little detail a little bit. Uh, the death of the author, what is known in relation to what Roland Barthes and all this other stuff, relates to the fact that there are so many processes that are so central to uh, human culture and uh, history and so on that are either sto stochastic or that we are not uh, totally aware of. Even language included ritual, the arts, and many other things which we sometimes call the unconscious. Uh, and all of them are playing such an important role in the fact that we are born to them. We are born to certain periods, to certain culture, styles, and so on and so forth. And our leverage to play within this is rather limited. And and we have to be the lucky few, we did the lucky few in relation to uh, human society, by and large, the myriads that are around, to have the power to change it. We have to, to have the skills, we have to have the chutzpah, as you said, we have to have uh, the uh, kind of environment and all these things that, that will give us the legitimacy and the power to, to make something which is which we work through as agencies in the world. So, uh, you, you criticize the one who wrote about emergence, emergence of the ch chanson as, a, as a character, something which, as if coming from, uh, from uh, autochthonically or something like that. But you couldn't really avoid all sorts of categories, historical, whether it's romanticism or many other things, uh, which we take for granted sometimes because we cannot, we cannot write it otherwise because they became sort of labels uh, that are shorthand sort of uh, concepts with which we work and for which sometimes we want to, speak to uh, um, emphasize more the deterministic element and sometimes more the, uh, those which are related to free choices, I mean, uh, kind of free choices, things that we are having. So I just wonder what, what you can say about this now. Oh, I can say about this. <laughs> Ruth, that was a hell of a question. I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. That was a hell of a question. Uh, I wish you, you know, has anybody, is anybody taping this? I'd love to have it in written form. Uh, so that I can go point by point. And it would be a whole article, the answer to that question. Uh, but just to pick a few things I remember from what you said, and many of you want to remind me of some other things. First of all, agency. It's true, I did make a big deal about that in that preface. I even put in italics, which is something I don't let my students do. <laughs> Agents can only be people, because I knew that I was going to get a lot of blowback on that, because one of the most fashionable uh, positions right now with, uh, with Latour, yes, you mentioned it, the person who is most uh, responsible now for the idea that anything can be an agent, as long as it makes a difference. So that is how people could guess. Um, and I reject that idea that everything is an agent uh, because in that case, you're really giving the people an alibi. I didn't do it, the book did it, you know? Uh, you know, um, we know about alibis. Uh, we don't want anybody to have an alibi. That's why I want everybody to take responsibility for what they did. And when it comes to the emerging chanson, I want to know who brought about that emerging. Uh, turns out there were printers involved with doing that, as well as composers, publishers, you know, uh, singers. There were people who used the chanson. There were people who wrote and pervaded the chanson. People whose business it was to, uh, to disseminate the chanson. Uh, these are the agents that I want to always look for. Uh, I do believe that we can always uncover the human agency, which I guess makes me a humanist, uh, which is why you the tour and I will never really agree. Uh, but um, the other issue that you raise has to do with uh, the status of the individual vis-a-vis -vis agency. Uh, and I don't deny that individuals play an important role. I see the progress of history as a kind of dynamic between powerful agents, individual agents, I named them in the book. You'll find the name books are in my book, you know. Uh, he's not an anonymous force. He had a name and he had a biography. And it's all there, you know. I, there were plenty of individuals, powerful individuals, 
but the powerful individuals act according to their opportunity, uh, or what nowadays um, philosophers call affordances. Uh, what it is that your environment or the conditions that uh, affect your life enable you to do, uh, what you are constrained from doing. Uh, turns out that most conditions furnish both enabling uh, and constraining that, uh, factors. Uh, and it's the job of the historian to identify them, uh, but always in relationship to uh, agency, to people doing things. Um, <coughs> and of course, since I'm very much interested in the uh, enabling and constraining conditions, my insistence that agency has to be sought you know, among people uh, doesn't mean that I'm attributing omnipotence to people. Uh, people are indeed constrained as well as enabled by conditions. But the conditions are not agents. And uh, the, the book that you read that got you thinking about what it is that enabled you to write whatever it is you wrote uh, was not an agent because that book was put there by somebody. Both the author is responsible for that book being there. And whoever it was who left it on the cafe table when you came afterwards uh, had something to do with it. People had to do something for that book to be there. I'm only picking that example because that was used as a counter example of one of the things, one of my one of the critiques of my position, uh, saying that suppose somebody found a book that I attribute a great deal of importance to in my own account, the uh, history of music by Franz Brendel. Uh, Franz Brendel is the culprit who identified as the source of the whole narrative that leads to uh, the modernist uh, viewpoint uh, that you were outlining before, Menachem. Uh, it goes back to the new German school of the uh, 19th century. So uh, his book was a tremendous, uh, I was told, you attribute tremendous agency to that book. No, I don't. I attribute it to the author of that book and to the people who then disseminated that book. And of course, also to the people who read that book and allowed it to influence their own actions. Uh, but I'm always looking for the actions. Uh, and the conditions that made the accident uh, possible or impossible, or if possible, then desirable. Uh, and so I guess, if what is it that I, uh, and I only brought up the question of individual because one of my critics, <coughs> who you've read, so I, since you read my response to him, uh, continually substituted the word individual where I thought he said person. Uh, and so that was something to analyze. Why is it that we have, we make this assumption that people act only as individuals, whereas I tried my book very hard to show that, yes, sometimes people act as individuals, but they also act as members of cohorts. They also act as members of all kinds of groups. We all have our own personal identity, but our own personal identity cross-cuts all kinds of group identity. Uh, incidentally, one of the reasons why I'm so against the, uh, any program that would try to reduce people to only one group identity, uh, whether that group identity is in terms of nationality, or in terms of religion, or in terms of sexuality, or, or whatever, uh, because we all belong to groups of all those three kinds, and many, many other kinds of groups. And we sometimes act in accordance with our group membership, and sometimes we act against our group membership. Uh, because our group memberships aren't always pulling us in the same direction. So it's obviously a very complicated situation. But I never want to lose sight of the people involved. And when you say that the chanson emerged in the 1520s, you lose the sight of all the people. It's as if uh, the chanson which had been living in Australia uh, decided, time to go to France, uh, or something like that. You know? <laughs> Uh, so, I know I only remembered half of what you said. This brings me to a follow-up question. Uh, uh, the historian has have many tricks in your bag. There is one trick that you seem to love a lot, which is what you call the historian's trick, which is to shift the question to what, from what it means now to what it has meant. Yes. We all students, uh, so it's a uh, why is it so important, and, and, and well, do you actually do it? Because yes, well, uh, I can tell you how I've done it. Uh, this is my attempt to escape from uh, 
um, what I saw as the pitfall that attended the so-called new musicology uh, that emerged, emerged. <laughs> <laughs> that several of us brought about uh, in, the, uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s, and since the 1990s, to talk about new musicology makes you sound very old. Uh, so it's an old term. But uh, the big change in musicology in the 1980s was the rediscovery of hermeneutics. Uh, once again, we're interested in what artwork signified. Um, and uh, there was an enormous improvement, it seemed to me, in the way in which we viewed musical signification because we no longer were content to say, well, there's program music that describes things, and then there's absolute music that doesn't. Uh, and I think that that was a fundamental and categorical um, distinction to be made. Uh, whereas absolute music does signify, but it signifies in ways that are more difficult to name, more difficult to put, uh, you know, to name the signifier. Um, so that was a plus. The minus that came out of that plus was everybody was in a great hurry to say exactly what Brahms Third signifies. And to paraphrase Brahms Third in words in such a way that as to imply that once you've read the words, you don't need to listen to Brahms Third. Uh, you know what it means now, so we'll go on to Brahms Fourth. Uh, in fact, I can tell you what that means too. So to hell with Brahms. Uh, that was the theme of the advice. Because nobody can actually say exactly what Brahms' third means. But then nobody can actually say exactly what Liszt's Les Preludes means. Least of all Liszt, who actually wrote that music with another program in mind altogether, as you probably know. Uh, and you can't even say what a um, word that uses words means, or what, what exactly what a novel means. Somebody once asked Lev Tolstoy, you know, what, what is War and Peace about? So he took the book off the shelf. He did have a copy. Uh, and he opened it up and started reading chapter one. And I guess he would have continued to read the whole novel. If he could have done it enough time. I mean, if there was enough time. Uh, and of course, you know, if you read chapter one, if you remember that chapter one, it's all in French. Uh, in the so it's a weird way of saying what War and Peace is about. Uh, but he's, what he's saying is, you know, you can't paraphrase it. You can't reduce it to a simple paraphrase. And that's what so many of my friends, and even I on occasion, I won't tell you where, uh, <laughs> try to do with uh, so-called absolute music in this big resurgence of hermeneutics in the 1980s and 90s. And I got tired of this effort to paraphrase music especially when it began to bear very bad political fruit. And I'm thinking now about the controversies that have raged about the music of Shostakovich, uh, which happened right around that same time, uh, mostly in the aftermath of the publication of that very notorious book, Testimony, uh, which was published in 1979, right around the time that the musicology was starting. And so right when um, my friends and I were rediscovering the joys of hermeneutics. I was seeing an enormous abuse of hermeneutics going on in this field uh, that was abutting my own field. Uh, and so that raised doubts in my mind as to the, uh, the propriety of trying to paraphrase music and calling that hermeneutics. Uh, but clearly, music does mean things to people. Uh, and the reception history of works uh, is sustained by the idea that the music is intensely meaningful. Of course, to put it that way is saying something else. To say the music means X, and to say this music is very meaningful. There's really two different statements. I'm more interested in the second one. I'm more interested in what is it that makes the music meaningful, and that can be approached historically. I can tell you how X, Y, and Z found meaning in Brahms III without presuming to tell you what Brahms III means. And in telling you what X, Y, and Z thought Brahms III, I'm telling you something about the history of Brahms III uh, and how its meanings have changed over time, or at least how the meanings that we seek in it have changed over time. 
And in that way, even my misguided friends of the 1980s and 90s, and my own misguided efforts of the 1980s and 90s, find a place in the historical narrative. Um, and can be illuminating. To be illuminating to a certain extent about Brahms III, because we're interested in how Brahms III has maintained his place, you know, in repertoire for so many years. Uh, and you can't talk about that, how music persists, even after the, the composer is long dead, and whatever it was that he tried to express is no longer necessarily relevant to anybody who's listening to the piece. That does tell you something about the history of the piece, but it tells you even more about the history of the interpreters. Uh, and those people are also agents. And those people are also important in maintaining the uh, repertoire. Part of the history of music is the history of the repertoire as the repertoire changes, and also as repertoire is maintained unchanged. One of the things that we've all noticed about the musical repertoire of the 20th century is it didn't differ very much from the musical repertoire of the 19th century. A uh, certain amount got added in <coughs> the 20th century, but once we got to the middle of the 20th century, the repertoire was fixed. How many works composed after 1950 are part of the standard repertoire? I bet you could be able to list them on your fingers. Uh, so why is that? You know, uh, so all of this has to do with perceived meaning or the perceived meaningless of meaninglessness of meaning. So that's why I say, well, we want to know what things have meant. Because that's true historical knowledge. And I could also go so far as to say that that is knowledge based on evidence. Uh, whereas if I were to say Brahms III means this, that's not knowledge based on evidence. That's knowledge based on opinion or knowledge based on belief. What is evidence? Evidence is something that you observe. So if you find a review that interprets the piece a certain way, you've observed that interpretation. And that's part of the historical narrative. You can state an interpretation yourself and then report it, and then you're observing it, and then it becomes a part of the historical narrative. But to say that Brahms III means that Brahms, a bachelor composer, is made uncomfortable by the presence of women, this is one of those interpretations exactly <laughs> as it was advanced uh, in the 1980s, um, it is not based on evidence. Uh, it's based on inference. Um, and so, uh, <coughs> truly, part of the historical narrative is to let somebody else come along in me and then tell you about it. Because I'm basing my narrative to you about it on my observation of it, so that's part of the history. So this is why I think we need to do that, um, to avoid the pitfalls of uh, simplistic hermeneutics and yet maintain the importance